People serving people, co-creating a shared place and space in the community where people do life together with other people. This is living proof that people serving people moves everyone's imaginations from tracking statistics on homelessness to celebrating human belonging. Belonging is not something that the marketplace tends to think much about and yet LinkedIn C-suite executive Rosanna Duruthi is quoted as saying this about belonging and the marketplace. Belonging speaks to not only having a space at the table, being a part of the environment, but also that that environment is one you have ownership in and you are invited to co-create in. People Serving People is the largest and most comprehensive emergency shelter for families experiencing homelessness in Minnesota. People Serving People is a dedicated leader in homelessness prevention. Their vision is healed families, transformed communities, and their mission is to see families thrive. Late in 2020, I had the privilege of having meaningful conversations with Ali, Robert, and their three young children, Joseph, Caleb, and Lamaya a family of five living at People Serving People, as well as Renal Ray, the new Chief Executive Officer. The gift to me in these conversations was working on that question about belonging, and then seeing right in front of me those who embody a vision of moving themselves and our community from statistics to belonging. I'm Robert. This is uh, Caleb. This is Joseph and Lamaya. And I'm Ali, but my real name is Dr. Andrea. Okay, fantastic. Well, first of all, again, I want to thank you. I know you've been watching the kids during the day. I know you've been coming and going from work. It's so much. And uh, I have two kids of my own, but they're now, my youngest is a senior in high school. So uh, having, your children here is really special. And I know it's been a, a long day and a hard, hard thing to juggle, so I appreciate you giving me the time. Um, well, what are some of the things, uh, favorite things you do together as a family or anything you're special that children love doing? Uh, I would say go to the park, they like to play basketball because we're ever got them into basketball. So only two big fans, so I just kind of like enjoy just watching them, you know, have fun with it. You know, that's what I like the most about it, is I like to see them, you know, do something they like. The second big thing we do as a family that seems fun is somehow we always end up on one of the Sea Worlds. Yeah, <laughs> they love the animals. They're like fish, turtles, and they love their snack time right before the sea life as well. Yeah. Oh, look at the kisses. You pay on me. I find your kids adorable, and I can tell that you love no, each other. Me. And that you like to be able to no, tell stories. Not me. Just me. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's great. He sees camera, so it's all about me. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I was interested in, because I'm telling the story of people serving people, and I am really interested in elevating individual stories and family stories. Um, and so if you're comfortable with this, share with me kind of how you came to face homelessness. And um, is this the first time let's, you've ever... Let's start from children? situation one. We originally, well, mommy, I was originally my mommy. a Gaylord and I was moving because I was pregnant Hi, and I was moving. Allie went on to explain that their family is originally from outstate Minnesota. They spent the better part of a year living with family members until that was no longer an option. Facing the reality of sleeping in their car or ending up on the street, the family turned to people serving people. 
since you've arrived here, being together and being in your own room, has that provided some of the needed space for you to kind of catch a breath and? Yes, yeah, more relaxing. It's not as stressful as it was when I, we were homeless because we were always stressed yeah. out, worried about, you know, where we're gonna go at next, where are we gonna be able to sleep at next, you know, where's the next steps? And now since, you know, we were able to be accepted to come here, and made a lot of relief instead of, you know, struggling. How would you sort of define home and like, what are you reaching for now as you look at, at uh, what happens next and how this is stabilized and, and what, what's next for you in, in, in terms of having a home? Um, you want to answer that one? Well, so far we both got what we want right now and that's jobs for right now. So on the side, we're also looking for a place to be able so space, having space to be able to put all the things you care about and have them for your children is really important. As long as I got these people right here next to me, a TV, a game system, and my magic cards, I'm fine. I'm fine. That's beautiful, that's fun. Well, um, you're a wonderful family unit who really loves each other. Um, so do you face any misconceptions like you're having to recognize I'm facing homelessness? Do you feel that there's any misconceptions that the broader public may have about that? Um, that you just want people to know about? I, the way I look at it, like sometimes people look at homeless people as below them, like they're nothing, like they're little people, like, like we're the out, outsiders. But you can say or think what you want, but at the end of the day, I'm gonna do what I need to do and stay positive no matter what I'm going through because positivity goes a long way further than negativity. And so that's why I, that's why I try to teach them, hey, stay positive and stay happy and just be proud of what you can achieve because all that, that's all that matters. Not only that, I try to put strong metaphors into their life. From from basically two movies, it's gonna sound corny, but one of them from Spider Man, the whole Uncle Ben scene where they, he said, "Comes great power, comes great responsibility," and then the last Rocky movie four, where he said, "It's not about how hard you can hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep on getting back up." That is a great set of illustrations to build a sense of strength and focus and resilience. Well, is there anything else on your hearts? Your kids have been amazing, and I recognize they're probably like ready to bolt. <laughs> is there anything else you would like to say? And this is a story about people serving people. It's your story. I've also interviewed Renal Ray, and we're just really wanting to highlight what it is that you would like the world to know and the community to know about this journey and anything else that's on your heart. Honestly, if you become homeless, don't be afraid to ask for help because I'm not going to lie myself. I'm not a person to really like for ask for help. But sometimes they come down to where you have to, you know, overcome. You know, you may have an ego big enough to where you're just like, no, I'm not going to ever ask for help. I can do it on my own. But sometimes they come down to that. The yes, oh, you know, maybe you step your ego down a little bit and actually say, you know what? Hey, right now I may, you know, feel like, you know, maybe I don't really want this or I don't really do this. But at the end of the day, sometimes you really need to ask for help because that's what that's. I had to and suck up my pride drastically. So it's just, you know, when you need help, ask for it. Don't ever be afraid. Part of our journey around centering families is really around centering families and that they get to decide what their path here looks like. So we really try to empower folks to, to utilize their agency, their voice, to set their own goals. And we know that our role is to come behind a family and support them in reaching those goals. 
through connecting them with resources, with materials, with services. Um, so some families might be working on um, accessing childcare for their for their kids because that would allow them to go to school or to to actually go to the job that they they have or they may have. Some families um, may have childcare, but they they're looking for employment. So our our team is helping them find employment. Some families are working on their housing searches and are utilizing our Technology Resource Center to, to find that apartment that they're looking for. So it really, like, there is no one track or one path for the, for the, for the caregivers in our space. Um, everybody has different goals, and our team works with families one-on-one -on -one to help them achieve those goals. In a recent interview with the media, you were asked this question. What is your greatest strength? And then you responded, seeing connections between people and ideas, which leads to recognizing the spaces for compromise. I think this stems from the value and importance of relationships to me, being the oldest in an immigrant family, and my quest for belonging and understanding. Take me a little deeper and share more about what you mean when you are on a quest for belonging and understanding. Yeah, some of this is really personal for me, um, and some of this I think is a universal struggle. Um, growing up, first generation here in the U.S., I never felt like I quite fit anywhere. Like I didn't quite fit at home because I was always seen as too American. I didn't quite fit at school because I got this brown skin, and the way that we think about American is not somebody with brown skin. So I felt like I walked this tightrope trying to figure, like be who people wanted me to be um, in the spaces that they wanted me to be in. And that was really exhausting um, and really confusing as well. So I knew that I was always searching out those places where I genuinely belonged, where I could be 100% myself and kind of bring all of the experiences, all of my identities into a space. And I know that I want to Kind of create spaces, create neighborhoods, create a home, create a workplace where everybody who walks in feels like they belong. That there is no question about their belonging and that they can bring all of their multiple identities to that place. I, I feel like, and I actually am pretty sure like all of us are on our own quest around this. And so if I can understand your quest a little bit better, that helps me understand myself a little bit better. And so the things that I try to do is, is just to listen really deeply for where are our experience is similar and where our experience is divergent. And what does that mean? Like, what does that mean for the type of relationship that we'll have, for the type of relationship I want to have with somebody, for the type of organization that I want people to, to perceive us as, and for us to actually really be too. I'm going a little off script here because um, I'm just curious how you see the issue of belonging and those you serve here at People Serving People and how belonging relates to their pathway to housing and wholeness. I think it's absolutely related. If you look back over 400 years of this country's history to even before we were a country, there was an idea of who belonged here and who didn't belong here. Um, there was an idea of who's, like, even how we acknowledge the land that we are currently sitting on, right? And whose land that is and who discovered it and who we discount is already being here. Um, and that, that history, like, was, um, institutionalized in the U.S. Constitution, right? When we think about three-fifths of a person who is allowed to vote, um, who is represented in that constitution, that foundational document, um, all of that gets carried through to where we are here. It is not an accident that uh, African American, black folks, and Native American folks disproportionately are represented in the experience of family homelessness. When we think about the laws and the policies that were set up in not only our country's trajectory, but in our state's trajectory. When we think about our history of redlining, when we think about um, kind of the forced removal of Native Americans from their lands and into boarding schools and the erasure of culture and language, uh, all of that has 
something to do with where we are right now that at People Serving People we talk a lot about and are trying to more deeply understand the impact and the role of historical and intergenerational trauma. And then to ultimately, you know, we don't do this alone, but we want to equip our staff to help interrupt that, or at least help interrupt a family's trajectory into further experiences of homelessness and poverty. Um, and so we know that there is this whole deep history and that folks didn't just, a, they didn't, it's not a moral failing that they are homeless. Our systems are set up to create this experience. Um, and then we say, this, like the dominant narrative in our community is like, well, it's that person's fault. They were lazy. They didn't do enough. They didn't pay enough attention. It becomes a moral failure when it is not actually a moral failure that somebody is experiencing homelessness. And I'm coming back to belonging because through history, there have been times where we have said these people belong and these people don't. And like that hasn't worked out for us collectively. How do you want to embody the changes you want to see in the world? And how do you want the staff of people serving people to embody? And how do you want the families and children to embody the changes that we have talked about of this sense of belonging across our differences culturally? Yeah. So this question of how I want to see folks embody a powerful, a strong and demanding love, um, I think it's different for every person. I think it looks different for every person. I think it's unique to that person's experiences and their identity. For, for me, I, what that means is that I'm gonna say the thing that feels really hard to say. Um, often I have not said that thing and um, have had to dealt with the consequence of that. So for me, love looks like saying the thing that feels hard to say that somebody may have a reaction to, but knowing that it is coming from a, a place of deep love and respect. Um, on the flip side, we had a conversation last week with our staff about a strong and demanding love can also be receiving the thing that is hard to hear, right? And to kind of using that as an opportunity for some self-exploration on why you had the reaction to that that you had. It also looks like shifting power. Um, it means that we don't have power over our families, but instead we're sharing power with our families. Um, and that I think is a really meaningful and a hard thing to do in, in some ways. It means that we're living more deeply into centering our families' voices and making sure that no decision about them is made without them. That means we challenge our assumptions about ideas and things that we want to do. Um, that is frustrating in moments because we might get to the same place, but that the process of bringing folks in and asking them the questions that lead to maybe that same solution helps them feel like they belong here, helps them feel like they have agency and they have power to shift something that will directly impact that, their lives and their children's lives. And that to me is how we start embodying this work. Teaching our children to remain positive and be resilient being open to asking for other people's wisdom and resources, having honest conversations, being willing to hear hard truths, centering the voices of those most impacted by historically unjust public policies and systems. This is what societal change looks like embodied. This is what belonging looks like. This is what people serving people looks like. And this is what it looks like to move everyone in our community from statistics to belonging.